Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Katrine Mikkel, and I work for the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. Before I get a start, before we get started, I just wanted to mention a few things. Captioning is available for this session. To turn it on, uh, you should find this option at bottom of the screen uh, in the Zoom toolbar. Um, you will just need to. If you cannot see it, uh, basically you will just need to uh, click more and you will just find this option. Um, one more thing, there will be an anonymous survey at the end of the session will be posted as a QR code that you can scan with your phone and also as a link in the chat. With that being said, I'm gonna just turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... So thank you for joining our panel today. We have four student leaders with us and they will really be the central part of this panel, but I wanted to give a quick introduction to why we're here. Um, so the session is called Belonging, Connection and Technology from the Perspective of Student Leaders. Um, and you'll be hearing from student leaders from three different but related offices on campus. Um, so two of them are from the AU core curriculum, um, the Complex Problems Program and the AUX program, which are two academic programs that are um, designed for our first year students and new students to AU. And then um, the Office of Academic Integrity, which is a new office on campus this year um, and is working on revising the Academic Integrity Code um, with some student input and student leadership in that space as well. So um, I'm going to quickly share my screen to go through a little bit of introduction, and then we will dive right into talk to our panelists. Um, so let's see if it's going to work. Do you all see my slide? Yes. OK, great. Um, so like I said, this panel is called Belonging, Connection, and Technology from the perspective of student leaders. And we really want to think about this from a kind of multidimensional perspective. Our student leaders are working directly with students, um, especially students who are maybe younger or newer to the university than they are. Um, so there's this aspect of mentoring and bringing um, new students into the community. Um, but there's also the aspect of being a student leader and what that means to be part of the community at AU. Um, so we're hoping to hear um, on multiple different dimensions and bringing in this piece of technology, um, especially with the theme of the Ann Perrin Conference this year surrounding artificial intelligence and just different evolving technology over time. Um, is it gonna... Okay, so our agenda today, um, we will introduce ourselves as the session moderators, um, describe the student leadership roles that um, our panelists are representing, have the panelists introduce themselves, and then go through a moderated panel. Um, we have about nine questions for the students that are prepared, and then we'll also have Q&A um, from you all. You're welcome to put things in the chat as we go as well, um, but we'll open the floor for um, all the participants to answer or to ask questions as well. So to get us started, um, I'll just introduce myself since I'm already speaking. Um, my name is Rebecca Comfort. I use she, her pronouns. I am the assistant director for AU Core, and I work most closely with the Complex Problems Program, the first year seminar within the AU Core. Um, and I'll pass it to Izzy. Hi, everyone. My name is Izzy Stern, and I am the director of our AUX program. So I oversee the AUX1 and AUX2 courses and work directly with our instructors and our peer facilitators. And I'll pass it over to Alexis. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexis. I'm the Academic Integrity Coordinator here in the Office of Academic Integrity. I primarily work with our students. So whenever they enter our office and enter the academic integrity process, I do the preliminary meetings with them. Uh, kind of go over our process, what's needed from them, kind of show them the information and guide them through the process. Awesome. And um, Izzy is going to give us a little overview of the AUX peer facilitator role. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the peer facilitators are really the heart and soul of the AUX program. Um, being students themselves, they're able to take on that persona in the classroom and uh, liaison between students and the instructor. 
And they're there to provide lesson planning support and they're meeting weekly with their instructor or instructors that they're paired with to develop plans for what's going to happen in class. Importantly, peer facilitators, we intentionally have it as facilitators because they are leading in class discussions and dialogues and activities in both the AUX1 and AUX2 courses alongside the instructor that they're paired with. They're also providing support outside of the classroom environment to their students. They're holding office hours. They're helping students understand course content. They're helping them get directed to services and support on campus. Sometimes they're helping with events and programming as well. And we often see that a lot of these mentorship relationships that peer facilitators develop with their students last beyond just the semester that they're in their classes or the year in which they've had their students. Uh, uh, and a lot of times we're actually uh, recruiting peer facilitators because uh, students are seeing their peer facilitators in that role and want to do that job as well. And so they really are central to the work that we do in the AUX program. But um, and looking at the complex problems program leader role, um, there are a lot of similarities and also some um, distinctions with these two roles. So the complex problems program leaders also um, attend the complex problems seminar and work with a class of first year students or new students to AU um, to help support them as they're transitioning, especially to the academic um, environment at the university, looking at inquiry-based learning, connecting their learning to Washington, D.C. and the surrounding area um, and the general community. Um, and the program leaders really serve, uh, similar to the peer facilitators, as a liaison between the students and the faculty, uh, really helping them learn the ways to communicate with faculty, um, their role modeling in class, how to participate, how to work on your study habits, um, boundary setting, um, different types of communication, peer to peer, peer to mentor or staff, peer to or um, student to faculty. So they're really helping foster those connections in class. Um, and then also outside of class, like I mentioned, with those connections to Washington, D.C., they host um, experiential learning opportunities where they'll take a group of students to a museum or an exhibit or on a walking tour of DC that really connects back to the course material that they're learning. Um, and in some cases, there are community partnerships like community service learning associated with complex problems. So it's definitely dependent on the class experience, but the program leader is really there to um, foster those connections for students and help them find that space on campus and in DC that works for them. Um, so the Office of Academic Integrity is actually new as of last year. So we opened in August 2023 and we're coining our wonderful student leaders that work with us as uh, committee members in the Academic Integrity Office. Um, so on into we're going to introduce uh, later is a wonderful example of like kind of all the options you have to be a student leader in our office. Um, some of those are listed here. One of them is revising the code. So we're adjusting the Academic Integrity Code to kind of be more inclusive based on a student, faculty and our office perspective. Um, so we'd love to hear from students. They can be part of writing the code. We uh, host meetings with them and kind of get them trained on what the code looks like and like our main purpose for having the code. Um, so we love student feedback and faculty feedback, of course. Um, they have the opportunity to work on a panel with us. So students also go through a training process with this. Um, students that go through the academic integrity process have the option on who gets to like adjudicate their case at the end of it. Um, some students choose the panel option, which is two faculty and one student member. So we do have a group of students we pull from um, that we can have participate on that with us. Um, we also love student feedback in general. So we kind of gather all their responses to questions about academic integrity, things they're kind of wondering about, things they're hearing from other students. And we design materials to hand out to students about like what we're hearing is most common, some questions they have and kind of address all those things at once. Um, and then in general, students can just be a mentor for other students around academic, or academic integrity in general and also just being um, a student body member around uh, American University. So we take all their input in for there and then they can work with students in different classes. So if they have, Anand specifically has worked with like students that he has in this specific, the school of, he kind of goes into that school and works with students in the classes, um, gathers their input and then comes back to us and explains like what they're saying, what he thinks would be good to kind of include um, moving forward and all that kind of stuff. 
So lots of opportunities in our office for students to get involved. Um, thank you, Izzy and Alexis. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that we can see our panelists more easily. And um, I just want to kind of reemphasize that all of these different student leader roles are related to the academic community at AU. So this idea of the sense of belonging, both socially and academically, and how we can bridge that gap. Um, so I want to start with introductions of our panelists. Um, and we want to ask you to introduce yourself and tell us which student leadership role or roles that you hold at AU and then why you decided to um, apply and participate in that role. Um, and I'll just call you all out to get started. I think that'll be a little easier. So um, I will go to Anand to um, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anand Balan. Um, I have a lot of different roles at AU, but most importantly, um, I um, am a, a, an important member of the Office of Academic Integrity. Um, so like Alexis mentioned, um, I have served on numerous um, hearing panels. Um, I uh, have, uh, have worked with different classes um, within the College of Arts and Sciences and to recruit um, uh, new students to join um, the, uh, the, these panels and become part of this process. Um, I'm also actively working uh, with um, them to revise the code. Um, and uh, I first learned about this um, from uh, Allison Thomas, um, who is um, a, one of the, another director there um, a, of the office. And, and, and just it just seemed interesting. I mean, I thought I knew what academic integrity was, um, but throughout my, my past couple of years at, here at AU, um, it just, just, I have learned so much and it has been a wonderful network um, making and just a wonderful experience overall. Thank you. Maddie? It's nice to see some familiar faces. This is my first panel, so I'm really excited to be here um, and have all your support. Uh, my name is Maddie DeVega. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a senior psychology student, um, and I have a few different roles on campus as well, um, but I am a peer facilitator for the AUX program. Um, Izzy did a wonderful job describing what we do, so I don't feel like I have to add much more to that. Um, but I will say why I decided um, to apply in the first place. As she said, a lot of the support and um, recruitment comes from former peer facilitators um, and instructors. And so um, seeing the role that my peer facilitator had in my own first year experience um, really influenced me to apply for this role. Um, on top of that, I think that it's such a unique role um, and job at AU. Um, I've worked both as a TA and as a peer facilitator, and I can say for sure that there is such a difference um, in being integrated into the classroom as a peer facilitator and actually being a part of the, that lesson planning um, and being a mentor for the students, rather just being on the back burner when your um, professor needs you. So um, I really think that there uh, is a lot of ways that um, the AUX program allows students to step outside their comfort zone um, and provide students with support um, beyond just traditional office hours and email support and content support. Um, yeah. Wonderful, Lexi. Hello everyone, I'm happy to be here. My name is Lexi Osborne. Sorry, if you hear background noises, that's my dog, I apologize. Um, I'm a senior clerk major. Um, besides being a, a facilitator, I also work with SPA events as a student worker, and I'm also a sign associate, student associate for this 2024 cohort. Um, similar to what Maddie and Izzy said, I chose to become a facilitator to support other students academic and emotional and social development just like i did with the two facilitators i had that i thoroughly enjoyed um and beyond that i enjoy talking and having these conversations around diversity and these systems that overlap and how they affect us differently based off of our background and our experiences so it's always great hearing from students from all over the world in the country um, and getting to see how my perspective changes now doing this like two years 
Great. Thank you, Lexi. And Esteban? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Esteban Garcia. I'm a senior program leader for complex problems. Uh, I'm, a, um, I'm a senior here at AU, majoring in legal studies. And yeah, the reason I chose to become a program leader in the first place was because, as I think my fellow panelists can relate, uh, our whole first year was virtual. So my program leader, when I took the seminar, was a very helpful resource to just understand AU without really being on campus yet. So once I finally got to campus, I really liked the idea of like being that mentor and trying to help uh, freshman students. And I've done that for three semesters already, and it's been a really good experience so far. All right, thank you all for uh, doing your introductions. We're excited to dive uh, into our panelists questions now. And I'll start with the first question that I'll also drop into the chat. In what ways does your student experience influence how you approach your student leadership role? I can start with this one. Um, I think very bluntly as students, we know exactly the kind of professors we want to be like and exactly the professors we don't want to be like. Um, there are certainly experiences that we have as students, especially with um, everything that is changing around what it means to be a student, um, the way that professors interact with us. Um, I think it's very um, easy for us to model who we want to be um, and how we want to approach being a student leader with students in the classroom. Um, beyond that, I do think um, there is a certain le level of empathy um, that is really hard to emulate when there's a generational gap. Um, and I think that a lot of the instructors that I've worked with are um, very receptive to the um, student feedback from a peer facilitator. Um, and so integrating my own student experience into what I know to be true about the student experience as a whole um, and allowing um, and being able to bring that back um, to the instructor and into the classroom um, has certainly been very important because there are just certain things that I think um, students know and instructors and professors don't necessarily know just about like what's happening around campus, um, what is going on on our social media platforms, what we're seeing, um, the general consensus about how we feel about world events um, is, is something that I think that it's very important um, for us to be that liaison between students and um, instructors and professors. And so that's something that I really try to bring um, into the classroom and into this role. Um, I can expand on that. Uh, for me as well, I like to generally be as open-minded as possible and collaborate with the students to get their input of what do they want to see in the classroom? What, do, what have we tried that they haven't necessarily vibed with? Um, and then bring back to things on campus, what is going on in campus that they would find really helpful that's on their mind that they want to spend 10 minutes to talk about. Um, how does that affecting how they're coming into the class? Are they able to have the conversations that we need to have? Do we need this space to allow them to get that off their chest to then move forward? Um, and then I, I think that just generally goes a long way of making them feel that they, which they should have power in the education they're receiving as well. And so it's not constantly like you're being told something and then we expect you to feel comfortable with a dialogue when you can still feel that power dynamic where I, or I think peer facilitators in general are trying to continuously bridge that gap because even though we are a little bit older and we have this uh, leadership position, we still want them just as much as part of the process and just as engaged. Yeah. Um, uh, moving to the academic um, integrity side of things, um, you know, just being a student, um, you know, also a, a fourth year student here, you know, just um, being able to understand, um, you know, uh, what students think of academic integrity, um, what things might cause them um, to commit um, these um, infractions, um, thinking about um, differences um, in how students view this um, versus um, professors and other staff um, here at AU. And so I'm just, um, I, I feel like I'm a uh, liaison between um, students and staff um, as I approach uh, my role within the, the uh, Office of Academic Integrity. Um, and it's, it just, it makes me better, feel better equipped 
um, to to hear uh, cases and um, and try to uh, adjudicate them as fairly as possible. Yeah, I think for me, similar to what others have said, definitely, you know, being a student, especially a senior right now, like having had so many professors in so many classes, you really take a little bit of what you like and you don't like, and you can bring it to your own uh, faculty member and mention to them what you think might work, what you think might not work. And also, uh, at least for in my case, like being able to sit in the class uh, and see what the professor is doing, you really get to learn from that and see how the students are reacting. So like maybe the professor might be too busy. Uh, doing the lecture but I can be seeing that students are, are maybe not engaging well so like you you take into account that and maybe you can give that uh, feedback to the professor so all of that stuff that I as a student know that I might get distracted sometimes so maybe the students are distracted as well all those little things really have helped me uh, do well in the role I think. Thank you all. Um, so our next question for you is <clears throat> How does your participation as a program leader, peer facilitator, or on the Academic Integrity Committee contribute to creating a strong academic community and sense of belonging at, at AU? Uh, so really thinking about that academic community piece. Uh, I can start off. Uh, so and, um, also, you know, related to academic integrity. Um, so really for me being able to, to go into different classrooms and talk to students about academic integrity um, and, and really just um, having having a, that, that conversation is, you know, spent mostly, you know, classes um, within the College of Arts and Sciences, but others as well. Um, and just, just being able to just have the, these conversations and set expectations about um, what it means um, to have, Good academic integrity practices and um, and and what um, the um, the process looks like um, if if there is if if a uh, professor or other staff member um, if it thinks that there is some infraction and so it's just just having a conversation um, you know especially like I said before um, going into my freshman year um, I know I, I just I thought academic I thought I knew what academic integrity was. Um, but just throughout these four years, um, ha having being a recipient of this information and also um, giving a chance to, to share it to others has, has really shaped my view on this. Um, for me, I think another piece to it is continuing to build a sense of confidence in the students and acknowledging that what you want to say is enough. We just need to work on maybe the way you're getting the message out but your words, your opinions, and your views do matter. And it's okay if you don't agree with everybody, you're not supposed to, you're your own person. Um, so getting them comfortable in, or working to get comfortable with who they are and their views and helping find ways to back that up. So learning how to use the AU library and other resources, the professors, other forms of media um, to help get that sense. And then as we continue to work on that and they build that confidence to share that with their peers, I think you then get to meet more people who agree with you, um, even those who don't, but you're willing to have that conversation and you can build from there. So you don't feel removed from the community and still keep your sense of self. Yeah, um, I think we talk a lot about this question in terms of what we as like instructors and peer facilitators, program leaders, um, and professors all can provide for the students in terms of belonging. Um, but I maybe want to talk about that on the flip side about um, selfishly what I've gained from this in the sense of community. Um, I think that when it's done correctly um, and you create a classroom and a, an open environment, um, there is a sense of community that is gained from everyone that's in the space, not just the students. Um, I've been in some classrooms where I didn't feel a sense of community and um, a sense of belonging. And I can safely say that like, when you create a space um, and you actively try to listen to the students um, and try to listen to your TA or your peer facilitator, um, that creates a sense of community that transcends um, a sense of community just among the students. Um, and so it's been really, um, it's been a really beautiful experience to like not only see confidence gained in the students, but see myself um, grow a sense of community um, amongst peer facilitators and amongst the students um, and something that I think um, helps the entire community as a whole. Um, and so 
being aware that it's it's our job to create a sense of community for everyone, not just the students, making yourself comfortable and making others comfortable. Um, I think for me, specifically with complex problems, a really good part about this uh, requirement from AU is the idea of like having the co-curriculars and the idea that students uh, have to have these activities outside of the classroom. And while a lot of them are related to the class and, you know, what it's been taught, a lot of them can just be like, you know, social outings for people to get to know each other. Again, these are freshman students, so they probably are still making friends. A lot of them might not have found really the people who they like, or maybe they just want to find spaces to get to know other people. So the co-curriculars have been, at least for me, a great opportunity to just also get to know the students outside of the classroom in a more relaxed setting. And I know with complex problems, there's also university college, which is has a living component, and that's like a subdivision of it. So I think at least for me, again, from my own experience, being part of this program also helped having a sense of belonging at AU and getting to know people that I still talk to to this day, which is obviously uh, an extra step that what you would get in a normal class in which you just go and then you leave and that's it. So yeah, I think it's a great thing about it. So thank you. Uh, so we're going to get a little more specific now. Um, as students are like moving and transitioning from being primarily online and doing a lot of their work online and relying a lot on technology, uh, Anand, how, what impact do you think that the use of technology has had on the academic integrity of students across the university? Maybe some students you've talked to and just kind of what you're hearing as a student yourself. Um, so that's a great question. So um you know, technology and its impact that, from what I have seen is both tremendous and uh, multifaceted. So on one hand, um, technology is great. We have, um, you know, like ChatGPT, um, you know, we have this unprecedented access to information um, collaboration, you know, such as Zoom um, and uh, an ability to, to research and, and communicate um, in different ways. Um, however, there also are a lot of threats, uh, for for lack of better words, um, uh, that that come with this this rise in, in technology and the and this uh, rapid a, um, um, ad, ad, adaptation to it. Um, so, like plagiarism, um, auth uh, unauthorized uh, citing of sources, cheating. Um, uh, I feel feel like it's. Um, um, a lot easier for, for students now um, to to commit um, infractions, especially with the the, the widely um, the wide availability of uh, ChatGPT. Um, and I have noticed that um, in a number of panels, especially um, last spring, um, as this was becoming more popular, um, nearly uh, all cases that I sat on in um, were professors um, uh, uh, catching students using chat GPT, um, either related to exams, um, homework, papers, uh, you name it. And so um, and so that's just, that has been uh, different for me. And so, however, you know, uh, revising the code and, and thinking about what part I can play in that, um, I, you know, uh, really thinking about the, the student perspective of technology and kind of bridging that, along with um, expectations that I um, know of from, from uh, previous classes and professors, just, just part of addressing the, these challenges. And so at the same time, um, you know, relying on, on these virtual platforms and, um, and taking assessments online, um, you know, uh, like the Rosamondos lockdown browser, which was um, used uh, up until a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, I feel like th those, are good approaches, especially Respondus Lockdown Browser, um, you know, because it allows, um, it, it restricts um, uh, what, what you can do when, when what you can't do online. And so that's just a, a possible way to, to move forward um, with this or more physical paper and pencil exams. And so, but it's just, just really exploring all the options. And um, I don't know if that's the best answer to your question, but I'm just, thinking about multiple things at once. That's great and so helpful, thank you. This question is gonna be more specific to our uh, program leader and peer facilitators in the space. From participating in and helping to lead AUX and CP classes, what impact does technology have on classroom interactions?
can start. Um, I think what Anand uh, was uh, getting at was really correct. Uh, technology is what you make it and how you use it in the classroom. Um, it can certainly uh, be harmful depending on the way that you integrate it. Um, if And it can be distracting um, if you let it take over, um, but it also can be extremely helpful. Um, a few examples that I, I can think of. Um, I personally need to take an abundance of notes um, of things. And so um, different platforms like Padlet and Jamboard um, that allow me to collect my thoughts, um, even as a student leader going into these classrooms, I have five other classes to do. Sometimes I need that time for myself as well um, to collect my thoughts and be ready to come into that space. Um, same thing with discussion boards on Canvas. Um, it, it really allows um, students and faculty um, to collect their thoughts and um, be able to understand themselves before um, perhaps going into a more complex dialogue, such as the ones we see in AUX classrooms. Um, so I think it can be uh, certainly very helpful and also um, certainly coming from the age group where we were exclusively online, um, finding a way to ease back into the classroom without um, completely shutting off technology, um, I think is really important for the ease um, and uh, in comfort of students going back into the classroom where they were fully online um, and then expected to be able to interact fully um, in person. Yeah, um, also just speaking a little bit more to inside of the class, uh, acknowledging that there are different types of learners, so visual aids can be very helpful. Um, in my classes, always have um, presentations so that could be using uh, slides go to have it very pretty using Google Slides, um, PowerPoint, and then in the class using YouTube or streaming services to show whatever we're talking about to um, use that as a form to start conversation going. And then for me in my personal academic work, I keep everything on good notes and that's my way of staying organized. Um, there's a number of apps that can be helpful for focus. Um, there's also Notion. Um, I think the other one's actually called Focus. So there's a, a plethora of them that I'll offer to students to say, this is what I've tried, what I've used, and this may be helpful for you. If you want to have a conversation to look at other options, there are a plethora of people they can reach out to and academic coaching is always very helpful, at least um, through my experience. So letting them know what their avenues are. And so in my academic life and in this position, technology is very helpful and I acknowledge the downfalls to it, um, but thoroughly um, is very helpful in what I'm doing with my students. Yeah, from my experience, I believe that, as it has been said before, technology can definitely be a double-edged sword in that, obviously, uh, depending on how the students choose to use it, uh, it can be benef very beneficial. But I believe uh, specifically for the collaborative aspects of at least the complex problem seminars, and from what I remember from AUX as well, it really helps a lot with students, whether you have to do a presentation for class, you have to be taking some notes in groups, maybe uh, you want to do some work outside of class, but you, you're just in like discussion groups, something like that. Uh, technology definitely makes it easier. And at least from my experience with my faculty member, he really likes using technology as much as he can to create like different uh, engaging ways of teaching the same topic. So instead of just a single lecture and taking notes, he'll send them videos, he'll send them uh, specific websites that show them to, uh, statistics and then send them to maybe gather some thoughts and come back and then they will put them in a discussion post. So all of this is definitely a benefit of technology, I believe. And at least from my own experience as well, like uh, one thing, even though I always take notes, you know, by hand, uh, I always like having my computer that if someone mentions something that I don't know, I'll just Google it to know what it is. So like those little things that can help you out. Uh, but then while also making sure the students are still paying attention and are still fully engaged in the class instead of being like distracted by the computer, or what, you know, their person sitting next to them is doing as well. Great, thank you. And potentially kind of building on what you just said, Esteban, about, you know, maybe being distracted in class and, you know, easily looking at your phone and things like that. Um, I'm wondering for everyone, what challenges you've encountered as student leaders in promoting a sense of belonging and connection? So whether those are technological challenges or other things, um, how do you overcome and address those challenges?
Um, in general, I think with how our political and social climate has been, it's ever so more difficult to feel comfortable if you have a diverging opinion. Um, and especially since AU is very much on the more liberal side, if you don't align yourself with those views, it's an added level um, where you may feel uncomfortable um, stating your views. And so that's been an ongoing challenge in my classes of how to get students to be comfortable with having a varying opinion that others may not agree with and being comfortable in stating that. Um, so, so one way of kind of trying to teach that lesson, I really like using the opener that I call unpopular opinion. So it's a low stakes way for students to say something that they know other people are going to disagree with and use that as a building block to say like, it's okay to have a different view and to stand firm in it and do it respectfully and have that dis disagreement with other people in a conversation that's maintaining a respectful tone. Um, so just continuing to have those reminders um, for them is one ongoing thing that I've been working on. Yeah, um, that's almost exactly what I was going to say. I think that uh, with the, the increasing technology comes an influx of information. Um, and because of that, we sometimes in the classroom have trouble disentangling um, perspectives and understanding what is true um, and, and still validating um, the students in our own opinions. Um, like I said, a lot of the AUX curriculum is built around dialogue. And so part of our job as facilitators is to figure out how to create a respectful environment um, and, and um, bring all of those pieces of information together um, and maybe not come to an agreement, but allow them to create a respectful environment. Um, and uh, again, I think one of the great things about technology, um, or at least the ways that we can integrate it into the classroom, um, is that it allows us in the classroom um, to get anonymous feedback or anonymous participation um, and see where the state of the classroom is um, and take it from there. I think that um, although it might be terrifying going into the classroom, not knowing is really important sometimes um, and being able to adapt um, based on the students feedback and where they're at with all of that influ influx of information um, is really important. And so, um, yeah, really just being flexible and adaptive um, to where your students are at, even if that's um, something that they don't directly want to uh, discuss with you. Great, thank you. Um, something we haven't touched on directly is how perhaps the increased reliance on technology might potentially decrease the level of confidence that students have in producing work that's like entirely their own, or they might not feel super confident in getting up there and like talking about what they produce because of how much technology is kind of involved in that and how sometimes it can kind of just get in your head and not really like make you feel super original in your own work. Um, so a question I have for our students is, how has your experience as a student leader been influenced by technology? Some examples of that could include social media, chat GPT, like we discussed a little bit, things like that. And how do you navigate or make use of these influences in maintaining a sense of community? So how do you kind of stay away from having these resources make the students have less original work and move it more towards that? Like how can we use these resources as a benefit to our students and use it as like an advice and kind of pull for our students in a good way? In one way, I'd say just reminding students that a lot of the works that they're finding are references and ways to help them build off of what their thesis may be. And so always making sure that you are um, citing your work and acknowledging that you don't have to have a very profound um, thing to say about whatever we're talking about. It's okay to just acknowledge what your impressions are of the works that we're discussing. Um, because that's what really matters at the end of the day. You, professors and us want to see what are you grasping from what your interests are, whatever the paper or project may be about. Um, I do think it's an ever challenging um, situation to work on, especially with social media and how, depending upon who you follow, if you see a lot of these people who have like study Instagrams and so you're comparing yourself to them and other students. And so it's like, 
a lot of hyper vigilant students here who are always doing something and trying to work with understanding it's okay if that's not your path as well. Um, so I say like ongoing conversations to acknowledge that it doesn't have to be perfect, but just and asking for help at the end of the day. A lot of this isn't easy and this is a learning curve for a lot of students. So um, yeah, just trying to reintegrate those thoughts and getting them comfortable. Um, yeah, adding on to that, I would say that one thing that I always tell my students, especially understanding that they all come from different backgrounds and might have different access to different types of, of information, as it has been mentioned, is that it's okay to not know certain things. And sometimes you don't always have to have an opinion about everything. Like, it's okay to say, I don't know enough about this topic to say, like, you know, to give a fully fledged opinion, like, but I'm willing to learn, learn more, especially like in my class, we talk a lot about this with my professor. And so that connects a lot with technology. Like we have students at AU who are very, for example, politically involved. They're always following on what's going on in the news and in the world, just like you might have students who they're probably focused on something else, like, you know, sports or movies, and but they're still want to participate in class. So I think it's just encouraging them to understand that there's a lot of different topics out there that they can have an opinion on. And obviously not everyone is going to agree with them. So, uh, and also again, like the, the background is super important uh, with, uh, for uh, PLs, we have to do one-on-one -on -one sessions with them at the beginning of each semester. And that, at least for me, it's a good opportunity to like understand who they are as a person instead of just a student. So what do they like? What do they not like? And for me, at least I try to like encourage them to speak on certain topics if I know that it's something that is connected to them in class. So I think that's a good way of like kind of like creating that idea of community and all of that among all of the information that they can get from the internet and technology. Yeah, very similarly, I think that um, one thing that I've personally struggled with, and I've seen a lot of students struggle with, um, in terms of being influenced by technology is just the feeling of imposter syndrome, um, and how there's so much um, information going around, especially on social media, that makes you feel like perhaps your opinion is not valid, or you're valid, or you're not knowing of something, um, means that you should just stay silent. Um, and as Esteban said, it's okay to just say, I don't know. Um, sometimes, um, and I think again, like Lexi said, um, encouraging um, them to um, understand their own opinions and voice their own opinions, um, perhaps would move us further away from the need to use AI and chat GPT, like people are worried that students will on assignments. Um, and so just encouraging students um, and providing different formats and outlets for them to express the topics that they are passionate about. Um, and not just being narrow-minded towards one specific assignment, I think is really important um, and would not only um, deter students from using ChatGPT because a lot of the, for example, assignments that we do in AUX don't even lend themselves to ChatGPT, um, but it would also build confidence um, and um, undermine those feelings of imposter syndrome in the long run. Anything else on that one, or are you guys good to go to the next one? Okay. I'll add one tidbit. Um, to answer the part of maintaining a sense of connection and community for my classes, um, I make a group me for the students. So they have a group chat of their the entire class, and then also I'm easier to reach um, individually if they find that helpful. So that's another medium that social media is helpful. And then just sending handles to different organizations and clubs that they might, that I might see is very useful to what their interests may be. So that's a positive way that that also be used. Um, and then the one last um, tidbit that I'll share um, is that, you know, related to these conversations that I, um, that I have with different classes. And so, you know, besides just talking to them about what um, the Office of Academic Integrity is, um, you know, I, I've had a lot of conversations with students about ChatGPT and, and how it can be used um, in a helpful, more meaningful way. Um, and also just encouraging them, you know, more recently to um, to reach out to the, the office um, and just learn more about academic uh, learn more about academic integrity by simply um, volunteering to help revise the codes, so like like read, um, you know, and I, um, you know, even though I 
um, already knew what what the, the the code was, and so just um, I forgot what what certain parts of it were over time, and just just um, having a chance um, to to just learn about the the code um, more in depth and and see um, what could constitute as an infraction um, is just another outlet for for, for students to uh, get involved with. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And kind of going off that a little bit more, um, what advice would you give students who are kind of unsure? And I think most times some students don't really want to come forward to like people who are in charge of an office. Instead, they would like feel more comfortable talking to other students, our student leaders, people who they can see like them, like their peers and themselves. Um, and so what advice would you give these students who aren't sure how to properly utilize these resources like ChatGPT, uh, Grammarly, other kinds of forms of technology? for their assignments. Um, I know there's not really a guide on how to properly use them all the time. So I know you might be hearing like confusion about these things. So what advice are you kind of giving our students or like talking to students about as far as using these sources like appropriately and stuff like that? And that could be anyone, not just like anyone really. Um, so I guess um, I can just start off again. And so, um, you know, my my advice and so what I always tell my students and, and again, the, the classes that I go into are mostly first and second years. Um, and so I just tell them, you know, just start what it means, you know, start start with what it means to to have access to all of this technology and, and just think about what um, and what they they would considered to be like ethical and responsible use of it. So um, could that so that means like understanding um, you know the the directions given by um, professors for certain assignments um, and understanding uh, their expectations. Um, also, you know, using um, technology uh, as a helpful tool um, you know for maybe brainstorming um, you know topics um, for, for a paper. Um, maybe, um, you know, re researching, um, collaborating um, with, uh, with other students, um, but just be, be vigilant about, um, about the, the, uh, the negative effects of, of technology and making sure um, you're not, um, you know, having it write the whole paper um, for you um, and, and making sure that, um, that you're citing um, sources properly uh, um, from, online and also giving credit to, to AI tools um, when necessary. And so that, um, you know, one thing that I learned that was really interesting is when citing um, some sort of a, a research article, um, ChatGPT will generate citations and it'll give you a year. It'll give you an author's last name. It'll give you um, a set of page numbers. And so while all of those elements exist independently, they don't exist together. And so what ChatGPT then produces is an incorrect uh, false citation. And uh, so just just being aware of things like that, just just looking at, at both sides of this. Um, at the same time, um, yeah, like I said, um, uh, properly citing sources, um, crediting um, AI tools when you use them. Um, if you're unsure about something, you know, students, you know, uh, I just ask professors, um, have a conversation with them. It's better to get clarity and guidance, and that will work out much better than just than, than being confused about the assignment and turning in something um, that's either that was not followed, you know, you didn't follow directions correctly, or you just resorted to like chat GBC writing the whole thing for you. Um, you know, and, and that that's one one message that I really push out to the students that I speak with. Um, but like I said, just 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 leveraging technology and just understanding what it means to have access to it, the both the 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 good and the bad, and just just staying informed. The only other bit I would add is when it comes to citations, um, using the writing center or asking the professors of like what resources they find are helpful. Um, they're always. Well, in my experience, very helpful if you have simple or even larger citation questions just to make sure you're getting what you need. I think another thing that I use a lot that connects with technology, uh, it's at AU, we have the library website and they have a chat function. So whenever you are trying to find a specific article and you're having some issues accessing it, or maybe if you're even just starting your research, uh, the, the librarians have been super helpful with me of just like giving me some suggestions for where I should go, what I should look. 
And so you can do that, like, you know, just sitting from your desk at home without having to go to library. So like, that's a very easy resource that probably takes you as long as probably going and using an AI tool to just come up with something. So that's something I also always recommend. Great. Um, so we have a few faculty members in this space. Um, and we are hoping that some of you can provide advice to faculty who work with student leaders and really focus on how they can facilitate student leaders promoting belonging, connection, and an academic community in the courses they support. So what advice do you have for those faculty members who are here? One major way that I think is really helpful is, especially on the first day or first week of classes, finding ways to connect with your students. Like besides like the typical, where are you from, hometown major, that type of thing. But finding out what an interest is and then building off of that. I had one professor who she really loves movies and media. So asked us what our favorite movies were and then followed up was like, you should also watch this. And so you're building that sense of connection. So whatever that interest of that professor may be, finding a way to add that in while also getting to know students. I had another professor every class also say, what's on your mind? Anything that's going on in the world, we have like the first 10 minutes just to talk about it. So there are plenty of students that would bring something up. And so that's our little way of getting to know everyone in the class. Um, and you get to learn a lot of new things that you may not have been aware of. So I think those are, uh, helpful ways inside the classroom and then of course outside making yourself available for office hours if you're able to stay um, well coming to class a little bit early and a little bit after so you get to just have small chit chat with students as well oh yeah I mean I wholeheartedly agree with Lexi and so besides like on that personal connection you know uh, moving um, away from that and, and toward the actual like uh, academic coursework you know having um, a good conversation about what academic integrity is um, and, and what it means uh, to, um, uh, to commit um, any sort of infraction um, on that front. Um, I also, um, you know, some thoughts that I have had um, and shared with Allison is, is that um, it, should, it would be good if um, professors provide examples of what um, academic integrity infractions mean for, for their particular class. So, you know, um, I'm a biology major and Spanish minor. And so in my biology and chemistry classes, that that's going to look a lot different um, than, you know, the, than, than other um, areas. So, so just, just like providing, um, so from the professors, uh, providing a few examples of what that means. Um, also, you know, maybe giving a refresher on, on what the, the academic um, process is, you know, if a student, um, it, you know, if the professor thinks a, a student has, has committed some sort of violation. Um, so just things like that. On, and also just really, really being clear on assignments, what, what the professor's expectations are for this assignment, the, the, the directions that they have um, and, and making sure that they're available for students to have conversations with them about the assignment um, and, and answer any questions they may have. Um, yeah, adding on to that, I would say like the way I would put it is like just be willing to learn from your students and be willing to learn from your student leaders as well. Like there are many times that even the students themselves would come to me or to my professor and just teach us things about the topic that we didn't know. So like obviously having that sense of like, understanding that maybe some students might know more than we think they do and just being open about that and kind of like, and kind of like trying to help them further that potential instead of trying to like bring them down to the level we expect them to be that's something me and my faculty member try to do a lot and also just in general uh also like allowing those student leaders to maybe give their input I know my professor gives me a lot of uh leeway on understanding the class and he asks a lot for my input and I think that's a, a big difference between, for example, having a TA, which only shows up a few times and helps with academics instead with like a program leader or an, a peer facilitator in which we're sitting there in class. So again, we get to see a lot of things that the professor might not. 
So just being open to listening and to asking for feedback and understanding. Because again, we as student leaders are just want the class to succeed as much as a faculty member. And I, I, at least for me, it's a partnership and obviously we want to make it work. So just getting that input from both sides is always really helpful in my opinion. The last uh, quick thing I will add is that I think one of the most um, helpful things that my current instructor, the instructor I worked with last semester and this semester um, taught me is that we really just need to be seen as people. Um, and that means um, like for me, she's allowed me to see her be passionate about things um, outside of the classroom and um, allowed me to see her make mistakes. And, that, and that's something that's really transferred into the classroom for me. Um, and that I think that students can be very intimidated, especially as first years, even though I'm only two years older than a lot of the students, it's still seen as a, as a hierarchy and certainly as a hierarchy um, where the instructor is at the top. Um, and so in allowing yourself to be vulnerable in the spaces, whether that's um, discussing a serious topic or whether that's um, just showing something that you're passionate about, um, that can be really powerful in the classroom and, and showing them that, you know, um, they make mistakes, you make mistakes too. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. Um, our final question for you is just kind of a broader one. Um, you've talked a lot about different ways that students can practice their agency and, you know, feel comfortable sharing in class and feel comfortable understanding what the requirements of a class are um, and the academic integrity code are. So um, just overall, as you're thinking about helping students feel this sense of community, this sense of belonging. Is there any other story or something that um, is important to your role or experience that you haven't had a chance to share yet um, that can contribute to this whole idea? I guess the only thing I would want to hone on is acknowledging like what Maddie said of at the end of the day, we're all people and showing your personality. And I think with a great sense of comfort, then you build that, or at least that's a bridge to start building that space where other students can see um, that's okay to be yourself. It's okay to make mistakes. I often stumble on my words. I don't always say everything pretty, but the point is that I try and I acknowledge to my students, like I tend to be an introvert. I don't necessarily outwardly do certain things. Um, and I'm here in front of all of you out of my comfort zone, you know, so it's okay. And then everyone has their own timeline and saying that as you work on the different goals that you have, you're gonna make mistakes, mistakes are great. You're gonna have some pitfalls and you're gonna drop some steps down. That's also great because you're learning from them. Um, so just acknowledging through your own mistakes, see as like uh, the face that they can see, like, it's okay. I make the mistake, I'm still here tomorrow. You're gonna see me next week. Um, so being yourself, and I think that's really helpful and just fostering that special interest because there's always someone else in the class who has a similar interest and it's like great to like mind melt. Um, so that's like my last tidbit. Yeah, I would say that, um, I would say that uh, for student leaders, it's important to remember that um, and for faculty, I guess, that this specific class that you are in is not the end of the world. Um, and, and it's not the center of everyone's universe. Um, and so and that might be hard to hear for some, for me too. Like when I, when things don't go well in my AUX class, sometimes I feel like it's the end of the world. Um, but again, it's like, okay, to make mistakes and it's okay. Um, one class is not going to change the, the outcome of um, a student's experience and it's not gonna change the way that they view you long-term. Um, and so making mistakes is important. Um, and, and I think with that comes a lot of comfort in knowing that some things just don't need to be taken seriously um, and, all the time. Um, and and that, that brings a little comfort in knowing that um, you can take a deep breath. Um, and again, like Lexi said, do, do it again next week.
and reminding your student leaders of that as well, because they have five other classes um, going on and they need to be reminded of that as well. Yeah, I think very similar to what uh, Lexi and Maddie said, I think I think of it as like leading by example. So like I've, I'm also a student. So like I've also had my first semester that I didn't know what was going on. I've had a paper that I was very stressed about and I didn't know who to go for. So I try to be very open with my students. And like Lexi said, like being vulnerable about it sometimes and being like, I was in your position as well, but like, you know, I was able to make it. So like, how can I help you make it as well? And and also like faculty members can also do that as well. Like, like understanding and having empathy. I think that's a big word for me on like how do students work? Like again, understanding each individual as a person, like maybe they have sports, maybe they have other things. Maybe they're just dealing with things that they don't want to share with us, but we feel it in there. So just trying to understand this, the, the students. And obviously you cannot give everyone like preferential treatment, but trying to see what you can do as a student leader or as a faculty member to help them out. And then if they're willing to meet you halfway there, then again, hopefully it can be a successful class for everyone involved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree with uh, with what the other panelists have said, have shared. Um, I just really want to own in um, on you know the the idea of of professors having conversations um, about what academic integrity means um, in their particular class. Um, you know, maybe even um, writing you know or incorporating um, a few examples of different um, potential violations for that class um, somewhere higher up um, in their syllabi so that students um, can, can reference that um, if they're ever confused. Um, just really having conversations and being clear, setting expectations um, from, from day one. I just, I think that would be really helpful. Thank you so much, everyone. I really love the, the theme of transparency and getting to know each other and, um, you know, being willing to share and be vulnerable to help people feel more comfortable in these different class spaces. And that reminder, too, that the students are in many different classes and trying to juggle all these different things at once. And so are the faculty and just, you know, kind of maintaining that shared humanity um, seems to be a major theme going on today. So um, that was our final question for the panelists. I'd love to open it up if anyone wants to unmute or um, put something in the chat that you're interested in hearing more about um, or any questions you have in particular for our panelists, please feel free to go ahead. I'll jump in with a question if no one else has one. Um, hi, everyone, and, and thank you all for, for sharing your insights. Uh, a question for, for anyone who, who's interested in answering it is, what's the, the skill that, that you think you've gained from this that you think is most useful, most valuable as you contemplate your next steps post-AU? Um, and did you notice that as it was happening, or is it something that you're observing now upon reflection and thinking like, oh, wow, yeah, like that was happening then and, and is really impactful? Um, I'll go ahead. I think that um, something really powerful that I've gained from being an AUX group facilitator is um, really very, bluntly just confidence. Um, I'm also very introverted. Um, I, I have always been a very introspective person, um, but I've always viewed my opinions as something that was meant to be inside. Um, and I think that having a space um, like AUX um, and being amongst peers, um, other peer facilitators, but also amongst younger students has been extremely validating um, and realizing that um, my opinions and um, my feelings specifically um, are are valid has been very important um, and that's something that um, I will certainly take with me. I um, am going into education post-grad um, and I would really really like to instill that into a lot of other people at a younger age um, because I think that's something that 
um, we just haven't forefronted enough as a society. Um, that's it. Um, to build on that, for me, I would have to say flexibility. Uh, every semester I've worked with a different facilitator or instructor. Uh, it's always a different group of kids. So it's not necessarily the wisest to have a certain expectation because you might think they'll be really extroverted. So you just, and then it ends up being more of a quieter class. So working around that. And then also just flexibility in the ways that I think and the ways that I approach different situations and being more open-minded. Um, like we, I think it was Maddie earlier uh, mentioned that I agree with as much as I pour into the students, I think they give me so much more. And so I learn a lot from them. And so lots of new things I've been figuring out and researching and thinking about things to what they've been pulling into the conversations and the different perspectives of the four um, instructors I've worked with. And just even in our trainings, getting to talk to other peer facilitators and what their experiences have been. Um, so yeah, I would say flexibility. Um, for me, um, you know, I guess the biggest skill that I've gained from working with the office of with this office is I'd have to say networking. I mean, I've gained a lot of skills, you know, but just trying to think more broadly, you know, yes, I've learned a, a lot about the code. Um, but um, you know, I just um, this has given me an, an, an opportunity over the past three years. I don't even know how long I've been doing this. Um, <laughs> um, uh, just to to learn, you know, more about the inner workings of AU and just kind of understand, you know, different perspectives um, on academic integrity from both the professor's um, uh, viewpoint and students' viewpoint, um, and just ju just build a lot of really meaningful connections. Um, I think for me, it would be like communication and how to like make myself and my opinions heard within different aspects and power dynamics. Like I'm a senior program leader, so like I have to speak with my faculty, but then I also have to speak with my other program leaders who I have who I have to report to the complex problem people. And then I have my students. So they're all very different uh, power dynamics, and different relationships. So like I really had to learn how to like deal with each of them and how I communicate myself and still make myself heard and like, you know, have that leadership role whenever I disagree with someone or whether I need to make something be heard uh, and how to, you know, how, how talking to a student is different than talking to a professor or a, a fellow PL. So like all that stuff has been really helpful for me. jump in with one. Um, I'm Jessica Waters. I'm a faculty member in the School of Public Affairs. Um, I'd love to hear, you're all juggling so many roles, and I'm like curious how you hit that balance and like what lessons you would want our younger students to know about, you know, some of you touched a little bit on self-care and like hitting that, but like, what are you doing on a daily basis to keep yourself whole and sane and happy um, while you're supporting so many other students? I'd say that's a work in progress still. Um, Welcome yeah. to the club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, generally, uh, for me, I think just doing things that are special interests for me. Um, I like film and media. I'm into the comics. So doing little things and reading as like my way of um, coming together. And also just if I know that I need to check in talking to my instructors or my peers just so people around me know what's going on and um, I think last bit of what's helped me get to where I am is uh, academic coaching I go pretty often and so I try to schedule out my week as much as possible in case I need to move things around so at least I have that certainty of what's happening when um, but also talking through it and continuing to build my skills to compartmentalize when I need to. Um, for me, um, you know, I mean, yes, for me that, you know, that's, that's, that will always be a work in progress. Um, but um, I, you know, I build in time every week to do things that are fun. Um, um, and, and things that I enjoy. So, you know, for example, every Friday night, uh, my, my roommates and I uh, go out to dinner. Um, I also um, have a lot of family um, in the Virginia suburbs and I make time to, to visit them, especially my, my grandmother and my uncle um, every weekend.
Um, I also love hiking. And so a few weekends ago, I had time. And so I, I, I went over to uh, Shenandoah and, and did some morning hiking over there. Um, just, just things like that. And just, and just I, I use Google Calendar a lot. That's, that's my, my, my lifeline right now. And just, just really planning everything out, in, including fun, um, just as a way for me to make sure I don't get overwhelmed or I'm not, or I'm not constantly like, uh, or I can't talk or just to make sure I do take time to, to breathe and, and relax and, and just not, not focus on school and everything else that I'm doing related to AU. Yeah, pretty similar to what others have said. I think definitely finding a balance between, you know, work, academics, and just like personal stuff. And at least for me, I try to do my best to like within AU and within my work to like find, you know, joy in the classes and the work. So it's also not a chore, but just like something that I enjoy doing as well. And definitely like time management. Like if you have a lot of meetings and if you have your classes and your other assignments, like definitely having all of that uh, schedule ahead and knowing when to work on what, like that definitely will give you more time to do the stuff that you like doing that's non-academic. It will also give you time to also understand in case you maybe have to sacrifice some things one week, but then you can probably do it next week and all of that stuff. So I think time management is essential for sure. We have just about five minutes left, maybe four minutes left now. Um... So if anyone has another question, we'd be happy to go through it quickly. Um, but something that kind of came to my mind as you were talking about, you know, going off campus or going to take a walk or just focusing on things that you enjoy, do you ever find yourself needing to take like a technology break? Like, do you turn off your social media? Do you shut off your phone and do something else? Or is it more integrated and it's okay for you to keep that connection going? Um, for me, um, I mean, um, like I said, I mean, I, I'm a big hiker. Um, I, um, and so, um, I, I, um, I keep my phone, like I, I'll keep my phone like on, on mute, um, um, and, and not try to be d distracted by stuff while I'm, you know, wh while I'm outside just enjoying nature, um, and whatnot. Um, and, and just you use my, my watch to, to keep track of, of my, my exercise. And that, that's a big thing for me when, whenever I have fun, just, just keeping me, my phone either turned off or like on do not disturb. Just, just not letting myself be consumed by the, the thousands of like Instagram notifications and emails and whatnot that I receive every day. Yeah, I definitely really like those technology breaks. Um, I'm a legal studies major, so there's a lot of reading that goes on with that. And I'm always on my computer due to my job and my other classes. So it's definitely needed for me to like just, you know, shut it down sometimes uh, and just go out. Uh, even if it's just, you know, staying on campus with some friends and grabbing a cup of coffee, going downtown, like all that stuff really helps me to recharge and then come back and write that paper, come back and do that email. Like all of those things definitely help you recharge and I've noticed that when I don't have those little breaks like it definitely makes me less productive which in itself just snowballs into being uh having a lot of other issues so I think that's a big priority for me <laughs> this is not necessarily the question you asked sorry Lexi so sorry um but um I think one of the greatest technological advancements was being able to shut off certain notifications and keep some of them on um like there are just certain people that when they contact me, it brings me energy. Um, and so missing those opportunities, um, like maybe gives me more anxiety, but there are sometimes I just don't want to be getting emails. Sorry, Izzy. Um, but uh, uh, so I think that like finding that balance, you don't have to be completely technologically removed, but just prioritizing relationships um, that are important to you um, can be re-energizing in its own way. I love that, Maddie. Thank you. Well, I think that is all the time we have. As you see, there's a QR code up on the screen if you'd like to fill out the survey um, for the end of the session. It was also linked in the chat. I appreciate you all attending today and hope to see you at more sessions. And thank you again to our panelists who are amazing as always. <laughs>